welcome and a very, very happy new year to all of you. I hope your start to 2021 has been a good one. My name is Simone Chandel and I am head of events at Women in Mining UK. Thank you for joining us this afternoon as we kick off the first event of the year, very kindly supported by Berenberg. Before we officially start though, I would like to run through a few housekeeping points. Please note, we are rec recording today's event. If you could be so kind to keep your mics on mute during the panel discussion, that would be greatly appreciated. Your cameras have been turned off, but please feel free to switch them on at any time. We will be taking questions from our audience via the chat button at the bottom of your screen. And we will be breaking away into breakout rooms to give you the opportunity to network with your fellow attendees. Further details on the breakout rooms will follow shortly. In the meantime, it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to the two WIM volunteers, Sanam Nurbash, Specialist Sale, Metals and Mining at Berenberg, and Nicola Shaw, Investor Relations at Pilhan, who are responsible for today's event. Sanam joined the Berenberg Specialist Sales Desk in October 2018, covering the metals and mining sector. Prior to this, she worked at BMO Capital Markets, where she was a sector analyst. Earlier in her career, she held various roles at both bulge bracket and niche advisory firms across Europe and the Middle East. She holds a Bachelor of Science in Economics from the University of Bath and a Master's of Science in Metals and Energy Finance from the Royal School of Mines at Imperial College, uh, Imperial London, I beg your pardon. Nicole Shaw works in investor relations at Peel Hunt, organizing all of their mining client result roadshows and other investor events. She has first-hand knowledge of investor views on the mining sector. She has seen in her corporate clients an increasing focus on ESG and the energy transition becoming a frequently discussed topic. Thank you both so much for volunteering your time and expertise to organize today's event. So to lead us into today's event, I'd like to now hand over to Sanam, who will be moderating our panel discussion as well. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to our event. Um, this year is said to be a very exciting year for the commodity space. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic has had a remarkable impact on the financial markets, leading to a broad sell-off in equities in 2020, which was followed by a bull market that has been no less remarkable. Commodities have not been exempt and the impact has been significant. Gold broke through the $2,000 per ounce mark in August, an all-time high for the yellow metal as investors were seeking flight to safety. Um, commodities, uh, sorry, we have, seen, we have seen a shift from economic support towards stimulus causing a rally in the base and bulk metals with an, an analyst predicting that the subsector is set to see the strongest growth rates since the post-global financial crisis era. Furthermore, fiscal stimulus programs to deal with the economic fallout from the pandemic should support spending on green initiatives and a global energy transition to decarbonize for a decarbonized future, which in turn is set to drive metals higher. The recovery in China and investor buying on the back of green-led recovery has pushed copper prices, for an example, to trade at $8,000 per ton, the highest level since 2013. Um, plans to reduce carbon emissions worldwide are likely to accelerate as governments unveil stimulus measures to revive economic growth in the post-COVID-19 era. In fact, on his first day in office, the U.S. President Joe Biden signed a number of executive orders yesterday, including putting the U.S. back in the Paris Climate Accord in 30 days' time. This transition to a clean energy future, which has already spurred demand for strategically important metals, is likely to boost demand from the mining companies that provide the necessary metals and mine minerals further. Today, we look at the role of these metals in the new energy era and how the mining sector can fulfill projected increased demand while also satisfying investors' requirements in relation to ESG. I'd like to um, introduce the panel who is joining me today. Um, my colleague, Georgina Webb, from Berenberg, she's our analyst, um, so an expert on the ESG side of things. We've also got Jessica Fung, head of strategy at Pala, as well as Tal Lomnitzer, senior investment manager on the global natural resources team at Janus Henderson. And last but not least, Jeremy Rathal, founder and CEO of Cornish Lithium. Um, I'd like to let them introduce themselves first. Please go ahead, Georgina. 
Thanks, Adam. So yeah, hi, my name is Georgina Webb and I'm part of the ESG team here at Berenberg. Um, my work primarily focuses around analysing companies and their exposure to the SDGs or the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, but I also analyse ESG risk, um, material ESG risk and sector specifically, um, looking at a variety of sectors. Hi everyone, my name is Jessica Fung. I am the head strategist at Pala Investments. Um, my focus is really on macro and emerging trends in the market, defining how we think they're going to play out to shape our investment strategy. Um, hello everyone, it's Tal Lomnitzer here. Thanks to Wimbledon Mining for inviting me to participate. Um, I of a four-person team at global, uh, Janice Henderson running Global Natural Resources Money. We run about half a billion dollars, very much uh, an integrated ESG approach to uh, minimizing risk. And, and that sort of turned into an uncovering of opportunity as ESG powers its way through the investment lexicon and the narrative out there moves more towards decarbonization. I'm sure it's something we'll be talking a lot about. Uh, and uh, what it's worth, I'm an economist by training and an ESG qualified investor as uh, the CFA has now got a, a qualification on that base basis. Uh, I'll leave it there and, and hand over to uh, to the next person. My name is Jeremy Russell. I am a, a mining engineer by, by background. I trained in Cornwall and then uh, spent 30 years uh, pretty much uh, having worked in the mining industry briefly uh, covering metals and mining uh, on a global basis for various investment banks as a mining analyst and a uh, corporate finance. And then in 2017, started my Hi. own company, Cornish Lithium, uh, which is focused on lithium yeah, yeah. extraction in Cornwall. So I think first off, we've got a couple of poll questions here for you. Um, I'll read the first one out loud. Uh, how do you think the mining industry should best prepare for the energy transition? One, increased mining of base metals. Two, improvement of ESG practices. Three, education of investment community on the importance of the mining sector. And four, improving the commodity life cycle through the increased recycling. So if you could just pick one, that would be fantastic. There you go. So the third one, one educate, education of the investment community on the importance of the mining sector with 40%. Um, a close second was improving the commodity life cycle through increased recycling. Thanks for that. And I guess something to keep in mind as we're going through the panel uh, discussion. Um, so, I mean, obviously this topic is very fast moving and let's start by talking about the commodities that we need to achieve the energy transition and deal with climate change. Um, Jessica, at this point, I'd like to ask you in terms of the commodities, um, what trends do you see and what is the future in mining in your opinion um, which commodities will be in high demand for this energy transition? Thanks, Anna. So let's start with what trends we see. Um, really big picture, decarbonization has been an undercurrent uh, for the investment community for years already, um, and in the world as well. You know, the global COVID pandemic, I think, accelerated some small corners of it. Um, you know, policymakers definitely made a lot more noise about it. Uh, so if there was ever a moment for green parties around the world to pounce on, this, this was it. Um, but generally, when we think about it, shifting demographics, uh, you know, we've got two very large generations coming up, the millennials and Gen Z, um, and technology developments, they've been driving this trend for years. I pulled some numbers just before this, this call, just to see what this trend has meant. So in the US, for example, electricity generation from coal peaked already in 2007. And uh, during Trump's time in office, electricity generation from coal declined by 25% in the US. So despite all the tweets about supporting that, the, the coal miners in the US, the actual generation has declined by a quarter. Um, in the UK, right? Uh, two months last year, electricity, there was zero electricity generation from coal. So this is a trend that has already been going on. COVID did not change anything. Um, and so it's really, really exciting. I think the one, the, the one area um, that has been really surprising recently is, is the electric vehicle sales. Um, last year, sales were up 40% 
around the world for electric vehicles, in Europe alone up 140%, one in 10 cars sold in Europe last year was an electric vehicle. So that is something that I think surprised a lot of people to the upside and has made people take note. Um, and so it's getting very exciting. On the commodities front, you know, we think about it in two kind of buckets in terms of commodities that benefit. One is where this trend continues and we see incremental demand for these commodities, um, but it's not a huge game changer. This would be things like copper and tin, uh, PGMs, for example. Uh, PGMs are interesting, including iridium and ruthenium, which are used, you know, in electrolyzers for hydrogen generation. So that's a whole other part of this energy transition that is that is happening. Um, and then, so that's incremental demand for these commodities. Then you've got some commodities that are seeing, are benefiting from a whole sector that they never really fed before, like automotive, for example. So if we're thinking about the transition to EVs from automotive, then you're thinking about batteries, of course, and you've got the nickel, the lithium, the graphite, the cobalt. Um, so these are really interesting commodities that uh, are coming up. I'll leave it there just to say that this is a very different economic recovery that we're going through from the financial crisis. You know, the investment opportunities now are much more specialized. It's not, we're not just talking about big construction projects. It's very specialized in this energy transition. Um, and it's a very long-term shift in our economy. So it's very, very exciting for us. Thanks, Jessica. That's uh, very helpful. And, you know, I'm glad we didn't just talk about the EV transition and looked at the sort of broader space of decarbonization. Um, Jordan, if I can just turn to you, I mean, obviously at Barenberg, we look at impact and sustainable development very closely. We have a full team, which you are part of. Um, could you maybe elaborate on, you know, what your thoughts are from that team and kind of not outside of the mining sector? Yeah, so much of our work over the past 18 months has been around mapping the revenue exposure of our coverage to the sustainable development goals. Um, and we've done this in line with um, what our clients, what the investors, um, how their investment strategies are changing as we move away from looking at um, investment strategies, which are only kind of excluding sectors um, and going into impact where investors want to invest in companies which have a positive impact on society. And the sustainable development goals is a really good framework to use um, as it has a really good um, balance of environmental, social and economic development factors. And you can see more and more corporates investors integrate them into their strategies. Um, the problem that we found with the SDGs is that they weren't created for investors and listed equity and it's really difficult to align business strategies to them. And so we've created the Berenberg Adjusted Sustainable Development Goal Framework in order to encourage investment into the SDGs and work out which companies are creating the solutions which will hopefully make the world a better place, you know, reducing environmental impact and reducing social inequalities. Um, at the moment, we've mapped around 350 companies to the framework um, and um, hopefully going forward, we're gonna map more and more. Thanks, um, Georgina. Obviously there is no one standard and it makes everything difficult. So it's always helpful to have sort of that overlay for investors. Um, tell if I can just turn to you, kind of similar question to, to Jessica, you know, from, from your side, what was your biggest focus in last year in 2020? And, you know, how do you see that changing into this year? Um, so 2020 was clearly a very unusual year from the perspective of the world, the markets, politics, uh, the list goes on. Um, the focuses for us last year were very much gold, uh, uh, partly as a protective haven, uh, partly as an inflation um, uh, 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 protector. Um, this year, less of a focus on gold for us, I'd say. Um, real rates will probably stay negative, uh, but, but gold certainly seems to have done a lot of its legwork, uh, unless you're an Uber bull. And I always say Uber gold bulls should be very careful because uh, what they're wishing for is, is probably comes along with the need to stock up on guns, bullets and uh, medicines. Um, also last year, you know, as, as resources investors, um, our portfolio is very much exposed to energy transition metals. We are big believers in the clean energy transition and its impact on metals 
it, it should should not be overlooked. And uh, we, we see real bottlenecks potentially emerging uh, across the food chain, the result of many years of underinvestment and the need for higher commodity prices to incentivize new investment um, and the, all the things that um, have been affecting uh, the mining industry, lower grade, harder ore, um, all the good stuff's been gone after, all of that stuff is still at play. Uh, so we do see a need for commodity prices to elevate in order to encourage new supply. Um, the areas that we're exposed to currently, uh, you know, span copper, nickel. Uh, we don't have much in cobalt. We're, we're keen on lithium. Um, and um, increasingly, aluminium is looking more interesting than it did to us in the past. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave it there, but maybe just throw in a couple, actually, you know, a couple more that could be interesting this year for the lack of interest that people are showing might be the diamond space where um, supply is coming off and potentially demand recovering, uh, as well as coking coal, which has been a really notable laggard against iron ore um, in a really blossoming steel market. Thanks, Tal. Sorry, <laughs> couldn't find the unmute button there. Um, Jeremy, if we now turn to you, you obviously have a very different viewpoint coming from the corporate side of things. Um, with sort of increased demand, as, as Jessica and um, Tal alluded to, you know, for lithium, for example, you know, how do you accommodate from a mining company perspective that increased demand? What, what are the steps that you take? Look, I think I think I'd, I'd sort of address that from a corporate point of view and and as an observer of the mining industry for a long, long time. Um, the mining industry is in a real a real crossroads right now um, in that uh, it, with the overlay of, of ESG, with the problems that we've seen over the last um, eight years or so where we've been in a bear market, and the industry now is being asked to step up to an entirely new market, as, as, as many of the commentators already said, um, uh, Jessica and, and Georgina, um, that they have to step up to a new suite of metals like battery raw materials, which they really haven't had to do before. And it's to, to step up production, because that is certainly coming, that more demand for copper, more demand for, for obviously lithium and cobalt, um, with the overlay of ESG is a really, really big challenge. Uh, particularly for an industry which has traditionally been extremely conservative. Uh, and really, I think that um, uh, how do they step up? They really have to sort of think about new technologies, new um, methods of extracting uh, minerals in a better way. Um, and really, I think I would like to sort of categorize the challenges facing the mining industry as no more ca uh, calling itself mining, but calling itself mineral extraction. And that's got to be done in a extremely uh, environmentally friendly way, given that the penalties that are coming, um, both from investors on the ESG side, and also one notable thing from the inauguration of President Biden was that uh, he said he would not allow the import of steel without, uh, from well, from companies or countries which don't have a uh, carbon policy. So that it really is putting the, the mining industry in a real bind right now as to what, what they do. Thanks, Jeremy. If, if we just uh, move on now from a little bit from the commodity discussion to you now, how do we do all of this in a responsible way? Um, I think this is becoming more and more focused for everyone as discussed. Georgina, from your perspective, what frameworks do we have in place to analyze, um, you know, the companies and ensuring that they're mining in a responsible way? I mean, you identified um, the criteria that you sort of set but if you can go a little bit more in detail, um, if looking at sort of mining and how, how you would look to see a best in class company. Yeah, so at the moment, there's a real kind of alphabet soup of reporting frameworks of how we can analyze the ESG credentials of a company. Um, you know, you have TCFD recommendations, you've got CDP questionnaires, um, and you also have GRI and the SASB. The two main reporting standards um, that we look at are the Global Reporting Initiative and the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board. Um, the GRI came first and the SASB came second. We at Berenberg are actually SASB Alliance members. And the reason we like SASB is because they have created industry specific guidelines for every sector to address the most material issues within that sector. Because if you think about ESG reporting or ESG disclosures, it could be everything that's not the financial reporting. So that it leaves you with 
so many different metrics to look at. And SASB really whittles that down into around 10 to 14 metrics that you can be looking at to identify which companies are best in class. Um, and then what onto the second stage of the question, working out, you know, what is the best in class company? What do you look for? My personal opinion is that we're not really at a stage where that is wholly possible because every company reports completely different metrics. It's voluntary, it's not uniform. So be able to really accurately um, work out which one is the best um, is really difficult. Um, I think at the moment, you know, what I would like to see is just increasing in reporting and that every mining company um, is reporting with the sector as much as they can, because there is so much risk in the sector. There's really high social risk and really high environmental risk, which you know could be, which I think is a little bit higher than may maybe other sectors, you know, potentially from the geographies or the nature of what the work is. Um, so the main thing we need to focus on is data and disclosure and transparency to then be able to identify best in class companies going forward. Thanks, Regina. Um, I guess leading from this, um, Jeremy, what, um, you know, you guys obviously as a mining company play a huge role in all of this effort. Um, what, what do you think you can do um, to kind of uh, address poor management of ESG and, and the risks attached to it? And, um, you know, obviously if, if there is management, this affects the share price. Um, but beyond, you know, you could do social licenses, et cetera. So very, very important aspect. And so it would be great to get your thoughts on that. Uh, thanks, Sana. I think that um, the, 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 the thoughts that I would have is engage with ESG right from the beginning. I mean, we're, we're very early stage, but I mean, looking at the mining industry as a whole, from my uh, long viewpoint, is to engage with ESG right from the start. I mean, we are already, um, as a company, looking at carbon footprint, um, the environmental assessment, the best practice to try and, I think it's great what Georgina said about um, uniform reporting. That's something that really, really has to come just like uh, accounting standards have to be um, uniform. Um, so do ESG standards really have to be made uniform so that people can't greenwash. Uh, greenwashing is a big issue. Um, you can buy carbon credits and greenwash your company. That's not very effective and investors will see straight through that uh, going forward. I think really my thoughts would be very much that you've got to engage right from the beginning and not try and uh, close it off. It's really interesting that uh, government uh, is very much focused on this as well. So your social license to operate uh, can be taken away very quickly. Even Boris Johnson mentioned tin and copper in, in parliament yesterday, which is great ahead of the G7 conference. So this is, this is really on, the, on the, the top of people's radar screens. Mining is at a really interesting inflection point. Absolutely. Um, Tal or, or Jessica, both of you are from an investor side. Um, you know, obviously you as a stakeholder play a big role as well. You're, you're financing these, these mining companies to kind of get further. Um, and you can, as an investor, kind of change the direction of where these mining companies um, are, they're, they're approaching ESG. It's a very proactive kind of approach, I guess, from the investor base. Um, how do you ensure that guidelines are followed by management? And what, how do you make sure, or, or what has been the engagement with the mining companies from your experience on that front? Tal, maybe we start with you. Sure, I was going to leave it to Jessica to start, but I'm happy to, to kick off with that. Um, I guess, first of all, we are very big believers in active ownership. We don't buy companies and then set and forget. <clears throat> we track them. Um, as ESG is integrated into our process, we do end up owning companies that are better performers on ESG grounds. Um, but things change. So we track them. Uh, we uh, use various external services that track newswise to identify controversies as they come up and then try and uh, engage with companies when they do. Um, in, in the last year, we've engaged on very diverse issues. Uh, we've talked to uh, fertilizer producer Mosaic over the gyp stacks they have by the Mississippi River. We've engaged with Israel Chemicals and First Quantum on their tailings disclosures, Pan American Silver on community relations, and their, uh, they actually joined the UN Global Compact um, short, shortly after we engaged. Um, and numerous, ES, uh, numerous engagements with um, mining juniors on their ESG reporting as they've approached us. And it's quite encouraging that companies are actually reaching out to us how they, how they should 
structurings uh, going forward. And, and just to sort of tie to the uh, responses that Jeremy and Georgina gave, um, what we're telling them is to follow, is to not be put off by the, the alphabet soup of the preponderance of different standards out there, to focus on one, because what we're seeing is that there'll probably be a lot of unification and, and mutual recognition between these various standards. Uh, we're guiding people to go for the SASB guidelines, uh, to report as much as they can in line with those, and to set themselves up from the beginning as they mean to continue. Um, with regards to this year, we've got projects underway to engage across our portfolio on modern slavery, which is becoming a much more prevalent issue and something that doesn't get talked about much. Um, and it's, it's, it's in this way that we're sort of hopefully keeping companies on the straight and narrow. And, and when they don't, uh, you know, uh, we don't have much sanction power. But our only sanction is to sell them, which we do. Um, for the first time since our portfolio's inceptions, they did not own Rio Tinto. Um, after the UK and Gorges incident and our very disappointing engagements with the company and the board after that uh, led us to actually sell all of our shares. Right, that makes sense. Um, Jessica, what, what is your take? Yeah, so we, we come from it from a slightly different perspective than Tal in that we uh, are a private equity firm for the most part. Um, and so we can spend a lot of time on due diligence. We're talking to private and public companies sometimes, um, but you know it allows us to really engage on on ESG, and that's a it's a big focus for us as well. Um, I agree with uh, with Tal and and Georgina. SASB is is we find is is good guidance for us um, to to go through and you know have as, has a sector specific checklist um, because. You know, we don't necessarily have to invest in an ex extractive company. Um, there are a lot of ancillary services that are related to this industry as well that we are interested in. And so SASB allows us to, to think about what's important. I think it's this also relates back to the first poll question where educating the investment community is so important for the mining industry. You know, um, we are finding as we're looking for co-investors in, in some of our investments, most of our effort is really spent educating them. They'll say, we understand that we need these minerals for the energy transition. We're not very comfortable with upstream operations. Um, and, you know, we've got opportunities with these other industries where we don't have to answer these kinds of questions. And so we have to sit there and, and work with the management team to make sure that we can answer all these questions because, you know,